So it's not real often that people get an entire chapter of one of my books named after them, but uh, our next guest does and did the hidden history of American healthcare, why uh, sickness bankrupts you and makes others insanely rich. Uh, my newest book in the hidden history series has a chapter titled with uh, Wendell Potter's name, Good Man and a Bad Job. He is the president of the Center for Health and Democracy. He is the president of Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation. He's the founder of Tarbell. He's the author of two books about the incredibly bizarre state of our uh, privatized for-profit health insurance industry, uh, Deadly Spin and Nation on the Take. Uh, Wendell Potter is his Twitter handle. Wendell, welcome back to the program. What's the uh, best website for people to track down the work you're doing here? You can find me at WendellPotter.com and also Center for Health and Democracy.org. And thank you, Tom. And thanks so much for including me in your book. I'm so honored. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, I mean, you've you've uh, you lived through hell. I mean, you know, and I and I hope I characterize that in the book. I mean, you just went through hell uh, as as a senior executive in one of these health insurance companies. Uh, you know, struggling with your conscience and and the horrors mm -hmm. that you were seeing all around you. So uh, I, I, what I wanted to talk to you about today, this, this, uh, uh, we finally passed a law saying that uh, hospitals have to publish this uh, prized secret, uh, this complete list of the prices that they negotiate with private insurance. And for example, at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, a colonoscopy costs uh, 1400 bucks if you have Cigna. It costs $2,100 if you have Aetna. If you have no insurance at all, it costs $782. It's like, what the hell is going on here, Wendell? Tell us about this. Well, as I've said many times, the insurance industry knows one thing, and they focus on that, and that is how to make as much profit as they possibly can at our expense. Uh, this shows that they are completely incapable of really negotiating favorable rates with, with hospitals and hospital systems. Um, because of the secrecy involved and they and the hospitals are very protective of that secrecy secrecy because it allows them to get away with this highway robbery that we're seeing uh it's it's just outrageous and it's as you noted you know, we you can get a procedure and pay for it out of your own pocket with cash and do better than presenting your insurance card in many cases it's just ludicrous, and the nation's employers absolutely should be outraged by this. We all should be. Policymakers should be as well, too. Uh, this should be uh, all that we need to get everybody up in arms that this system doesn't work for anybody anymore except insurance companies and the, and the shareholders. Yeah. Now, there are two pieces to this. The, the, uh, the hospitals and the Republican Party, number one, didn't want people to be able to compare these prices. But then secondly, the whole sales pitch that the GOP makes is, well, you know, if you can compare medical prices, then when somebody has a heart attack and they're thinking of going to, you know, picking one of the nearby hospitals, they'll call around and fi figure out which hospital has uh, the, the, the best uh, price on having a heart attack treated, lowest cost for open heart surgery, uh, the best results, um, you know, before they dial 911 for the ambulance. Um, right. it, which seems to make no sense to me whatsoever, but um, speak to this. How did we end up with this? Well, it is, it is based on the Republican Party's uh, position that all we need really is transparency for the free market to work. And of course, you have to have price transparency for any element of our capitalistic society uh, to function appropriately. You have nothing anywhere close to that. And even when Congress passes laws, when the federal government says to hospitals, you got, and, and to insurance companies, you have to disclose this, um, they don't care. Uh, many of them are f flouting that requirement and not doing it. Others just assume that there are going to be no consequences for the public to see these wide variations. And uh, that's why this keeps going on. Uh, first of all, you certainly cannot call when you're uh, a victim of an accident or suffering from the symptoms of a heart attack, you're not going to call around and check to see where you can get the best deal. That doesn't happen. Uh, so that in itself is, is foolish thinking. It seems to me, Wendell Potter, that the, that the notion of the commons is, uh, you know, ever since uh, Reagan put Bill Bennett in charge of the, of the education department in, the, in you know, our federal government and 
we stopped teaching civics in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could you could stop the yeah. average person who is you know uh, under 50 and say what is the commons and they'd give you a blank stare they have no idea they would but you know yeah. the bottom line of the commons is it's the stuff where fundamentally you have no choice right the commons is the stuff where if you if your house is on fire you want the fire department if you're being robbed you want the police department if uh, you know, if if you uh, need water in your home, you need the water company. If you need sewage coming out of your home, you need the sewage company. If you need electricity, you need electricity coming into your house. These are the things where the choice is just not even a rational option. You right. just you know you and and so if it's going to be provided to everybody and it's going to be provided equally to everybody then it should be considered part of the commons and by definition governments are created to administer the commons and yes. and it seems to me that and i think the example of the heart attack that that you were just referring to and and that i was uh, referencing is like the, probably you know writ large the biggest example of this but uh, you could take it all the way down to a broken leg or something that that they're really this idea of choice in medicine is vastly overrated um, outside of just you know picking your doctor and going in and getting a physical every year because when you're having a crisis and not all medicine obviously is crisis driven but when you're having a crisis that's not the moment that you stop and, and say I need to make choices that's the moment right. at which you say I need to get help right now and all right. of that and that's why the United States is literally the only developed country in the world that doesn't have a national healthcare system and doesn't define healthcare as a right rather than a privilege. Can you speak to that? Well, you're exactly right. We alone in the developed world have a system like this in which we let insurance companies and big hospital systems hide behind secrecy and essentially call the shots and uh, pick our pockets as a consequence as we're seeing from this reporting. Uh, it's not new. I mean, we've seen this kind of reporting before. The policymakers look at it and typically just turn the other way and say, well, that's just the way it is. That's the free market at work. It does not work. It is an example of market failure. Uh, and you're exactly right, too. Your reference to uh, the fact that most of our schools don't even ta teach civics anymore. We don't teach uh, critical thinking skills. Uh, and so consequently, we have a, a, a very unequipped population to even uh, begin to make uh, heads or tails of, of what's happening in our health care system. It's, it's just ludicrous. So you were a senior executive with one of the top uh, three insurance companies in the United States. You've seen this from the inside. You've seen the health care system. You've also seen the health care system, you know, as all of us have as a consumer of health care in the United States. And I know that you've traveled around the world and you're familiar with how health care plays out in other countries. In your opinion, in your very well-educated opinion, Wendell Potter, what should we be doing here in the United States? We should be doing what Maryland is doing. Maryland stands out as the one state that seems to have figured out how you can address this particular situation. In Maryland, hospitals are paid the same thing for every procedure, uh, that, uh, regardless of whether the payer is Medicare or uh, an insurance company or out of pocket. Uh, right. It's called global budgeting, uh, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Now, in the bills to establish a Medicare for all system, uh, at least on the House side, in Pramila J Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal's bill, she calls for that. But it's already something that's proven to work and works very well. Uh, and the folks in Maryland, uh, including uh, policymakers and employers and hospital executives will attest to the fact that that works and you don't have this kind of a situation like you have at uh, uh, Boston, you know, at, at, uh, Mass General or, or at these other hospitals that the, 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 the New York Times is highlighting uh, in other parts of the country. Even Massachusetts, liberal Massachusetts, it's, it's ridiculous how wide the, 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 the variance is in terms of how much uh, hospitals will charge insurance companies and, and their patients. The other thing I want to keep in mind is that patients need to care about this because most of us are now in high deductible plans. And our out-of-pocket obligations are tied to what the hospitals charge or what the uh, insurers have negotiated 
with uh, with those hospital systems. So uh, we were that's just a yet another way that insurance companies are picking our pocket but making us pay more for care and it's based on uh, that those negotiated rates which can be just outrageously high much more than another insurance company has negotiated. Should we just you know say you know okay health insurance companies if you want to serve you know a, a super high-end audience like you do in some other countries where you know, a, a wealthy person can buy essentially supplemental health insurance so that if they right. end up in the hospital, they end up with a private suite, or if they're out of, out of country, they get flown in by, you know, private jet, um, you know, or they've got a chef preparing their meals. But, but uh, basically, that's it. That's the only kind of health insurance you can provide because all the rest of us are going to go with a system like Canada has, where everybody has Medicare in Canada. Yeah. Uh, regardless yeah. of age, is is that the way to go? It, to, to, do you think Canada is the best example for us? I think Canada is the best example, but uh, Canada implemented that many years ago, more you know half a century ago. It would be very difficult for us to uh, copy them entirely. I think what you're describing could work best, and it's a system that the UK has, uh, which is something we might want to consider. They do have socialized medicine, but your point about being able to buy insurance if you've got the means and want to do it. Uh, I used to work for Humana when ha Humana had hospitals in London. Humana Hospital Wellington was was one of the hospitals where I would visit. And sure enough, you'd get a very fine room uh, and beef Wellington if you if you if, <laughs> if you can if you can uh, uh, if your diet would allow that. Uh, in fact, I had beef Wellington with the, uh, the CEO of that hospital. That's that's an example, and I do think that because we have so many, you know, a fair number of wealthy people in this country who hold all almost all power, that might be what we wind up with. It's just some means that if you're rich enough, uh, you can buy insurance for a private room and beef Wellington. Right. There, there you go. You can have your beef Wellington, and the rest of us can have health insurance. Right. Wendell Potter, uh, WendellPotter.com. Uh, you can tweet him at Wendell Potter. Wendell, uh, and also uh, Deadly Spin and Nation on the Take, his two books are, are just must-reads.